Hey guys, and welcome to week three of Anatomy and Physiology Lab. This week we'll be covering exercise six, classification of tissues. Last week we spent time reviewing the basic unit of life, the cell. From DNA to ATP synthesis, there's a lot taking place within each cell in our body. Cells aren't only operating as individual units, but are working together to perform specific functions. Cells that are similar in structure and function group together to form tissues. There are four primary tissue types, epithelium, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and muscle, each with distinctive structures, patterns, and functions. Each of the four main tissue types are further divided into subcategories that we'll cover later today. If you recall our first pre-lab lecture, we briefly mentioned that tissues are organized into organs such as the heart, kidneys, and lungs. Most organs contain several of the primary tissues, and the arrangement of these tissues determines the organ's structure and function. In order to better understand organs and organ systems, we'll be spending time studying histology in lab. This flowchart breaks down the four primary tissue types in their subcategories for easy visualization and study. We're going to start with epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue, or epithelium, is a sheet of cells that covers a body surface or lines a body cavity. Epithelial functions include protection, absorption, filtration, excretion, secretion, and sensory reception. Epithelial tissue occurs in the body as either a covering or lining, or as a gland. There are two types of glands, endocrine glands and exocrine glands, which we will discuss in greater detail next week. Your skin is a prime example of an organ containing epithelial tissue acting as our first line of defense against bacterial invasion, chemical damage, and more. Another example of specialized epithelium is the lining of the stomach and small intestine, where it absorbs and secretes substances to aid in digestive processes. When studying epithelial tissue, it's important to remember that it exhibits polarity, meaning it has one free surface, called the apical surface, facing outward or towards the external environment, and a basal surface that attaches to the basement membrane. The apical surface is often significantly different than the basal surface, and is specialized to perform specific functions. Epithelia are classified according to two criteria, number of cell layers and cell shape. Based on cell layers, epithelia can be classified as either simple or stratified. Simple epithelia consist of one layer of cells attached to the basement membrane, while stratified epithelia consist of two or more layers of cells. Based on cell shape, Epithelia can be classified as squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. Cell layers and cell shape are combined in a two-part naming system used to describe epithelial tissue. When studying stratified epithelia, the tissue name is based on the cells of the apical surface, not those resting on the basement membrane. In exercise 6, activity 1, you'll be observing the most common types of epithelia, their characteristic locations in the body, and their functions. These tissues include simple squamous epithelium, a single layer of flattened cells so thin that it allows for materials to pass via diffusion or filtration, as it does during gas exchange in the alveoli of the lungs, for example. Simple cuboidal epithelium, a single layer of cube-like cells with large, spherical central nuclei. Its function is excretion and absorption, and can be found in kidney tubules, ovaries, and glands. As you can see, the simple cuboidal cells are arranged in a circle around a central lumen, which receives the secretion produced by the cuboidal cells. Look for this characteristic when identifying simple cuboidal epithelium. Simple columnar epithelium, a single layer of tall cells with round to oval nuclei sometimes containing mucus-secreting glands called goblet cells. Its main function is absorption and secretion of mucus, enzymes, and other substances. This tissue lines most of the digestive tract, while a ciliated variety lines fallopian tubes and regions of the uterus. The rhythmic movement of the cilia helps to propel the egg towards the uterus. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium is one of the oddball types of epithelial tissue that doesn't quite fit into our two-step naming system. This tissue is a single layer of cells, but appears to be multilayered due to nuclei seen at different levels, hence the name pseudostratified. 
Like simple columnar epithelium, pseudostratified columnar epithelium may contain goblet cells and bare cilia. Its main function is the secretion of mucus and its subsequent propulsion via ciliary action. The most notable location of pseudostratified columnar epithelium is the lining of the trachea, where it propels mucus upwards, preventing it from entering the lungs. Stratified squamous epithelium is composed of several cell layers, with the apical surface cells being the characteristic flattened squamous shape. Its main function is protection. For example, the keratinized variety forms the epidermis of the skin. Stratified cuboidal epithelium is typically made up of two layers of cube-like cells. This tissue type is found in sweat glands, mammary glands, and salivary glands, with its main function being protection. As with simple cuboidal epithelium, stratified cuboidal epithelium forms a circular shape around the lumen of a duct. Stratified columnar epithelium is composed of several cell layers, with the superficial cells elongated and column-shaped. Its main functions are protection and secretion, and is considered rare in the body. Transitional epithelium is another type of epithelia in the category of its own. This tissue resembles both stratified squamous and stratified cuboidal epithelium, with characteristic dome-shaped superficial cells. This unique tissue is found in the urinary system, lining the ureters, parts of the urethra, and the bladder. The balloon-like cells stretch readily, transitioning in size to allow for changing volumes of urine within urinary organs. Connective tissue is found in all parts of the body and is the most abundant and widely distributed of the main tissue types. There are four main types of adult connective tissue. Connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone, and blood. Connective tissue proper is again subdivided into two subclasses loose connective tissue, and dense connective tissue. Connective tissues perform a variety of functions, but primarily protect, support, insulate, and bind together other tissues of the body. For example, bones are composed of connective tissue called osseous tissue, and their function is to protect and support other body tissues and organs. Ligaments and tendons bind bones together or connect muscle to bone, while adipose tissue provides insulation. Most types of connective tissue are highly vascularized, with a rich blood supply. An exception to this would be cartilage, which is avascular and receives no blood supply directly. Have you ever wondered why it took so long to heal that cartilage piercing? A poor blood supply is the culprit. A defining characteristic of connective tissue is its extracellular matrix composed of a non-cellular, non-living matrix between connective tissue cells. The extracellular matrix is comprised of ground substance and fibers. When the matrix is firm, as in cartilage and bone, the connective tissue cells are housed in cavities called lacuna. Connective tissue fibers include collagen fibers, elastin fibers, and reticular fibers, with collagen being the most abundant. When studying connective tissue, keep in mind this common structural plan consisting of the connective tissue cells, surrounding extracellular matrix, and fibers. In exercise 6, activity 2, you'll be examining different types of connective tissue, their characteristic locations in the body, and their functions. Mesenchyme is the embryonic connective tissue from which all other connective tissues are derived. This connective tissue is found primarily in the embryo. Connective tissue proper is divided into loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. Loose connective tissue includes areolar, adipose, and reticular, while dense connective tissue includes dense regular, elastic, and dense irregular. Areolar loose connective tissue has a gel-like matrix with all three fiber types present. Areolar loose connective tissue packages and cushions organs and is widely distributed under the epithelia of the body. Adipose loose connective tissue is made up of closely packed fat cells called adipocytes. Its hollow, bubble-like appearance makes it seem anucleate, but in reality, the nucleus is pushed to the side of the cell. Adipose insulates against heat loss, supports and protects organs, and stores energy. This tissue is widely distributed throughout the body under skin and within the abdomen. Reticular loose connective tissue is composed of reticular fibers in a loose matrix. 
The reticular fibers form a soft support network for other cell types, including white blood cells. This tissue is found in the organs of the lymphatic system. Dense regular connective tissue is composed of parallel collagen fibers and fibroblasts, cells that create the extracellular matrix and fibers. This strong tissue makes up tendons and most ligaments, connecting bone to bone and muscle to bone. Elastic connective tissue contains mostly elastic fibers. Like the name suggests, this tissue allows for recoil after stretching. Because of its strength and recoil, elastic connective tissue is found in the walls of large arteries, vertebral ligaments, and within bronchial tubes. Dense irregular connective tissue is primarily comprised of irregularly arranged collagen fibers and fibroblasts. This strong tissue is able to withstand multidirectional tension and is found within joints in the dermis of the skin. There are three types of cartilage in the body, hyalin, elastic, and fibrocartilage. A defining characteristic of cartilage is the presence of chondrocytes, the cells responsible for maintaining the cartilaginous matrix. Chondroblasts are the cells that produce the cartilaginous matrix. Once they mature, they are then called chondrocytes and are isolated in small cavities throughout the cartilage called lacuna. Hyaline cartilage connective tissue provides support, cushion, and resists compression. Hyaline cartilage forms most of the embryonic skeleton and covers the ends of long bones and joints, forms costal cartilages of the ribs, and forms the nose, trachea, and larynx. Elastic cartilage connective tissue is similar to hyaline cartilage, but has more elastic fibers in its extracellular matrix. This cartilage maintains a structure shape while allowing great flexibility. Elastic cartilage is found in the external ear and epiglottis. Fibrocartilage is predominantly comprised of thick collagen fibers. Fibrocartilage absorbs compressive shock and is found within intervertebral discs, the pubic symphysis, and the discs of the knee joint. Again, you can see the chondrocytes in the lacuna. Bone, or osseous connective tissue, is made up of a hard, calcified matrix containing many collagen fibers. Like the chondrocytes found within cartilage, Osseous tissue houses its own specialized regulatory cells called osteocytes. Osteocytes are derived from the osseous forming osteoblasts. Like chondrocytes, osteocytes are also isolated within lacuna. Osseous tissue is very well vascularized, receiving an ample blood supply. The microscopic anatomy of osseous tissue is unique. When viewing a cross section of bone under the microscope, you'll see a large central canal which contains a network of blood vessels. Lamella, layers of compact matrix, surround the central canal. Blood is the final connective tissue that will cover. Blood is comprised of red and white blood cells, with a fluid matrix that sets it apart from the other types of connective tissue. Blood's fluid matrix is called plasma. Nervous tissue is made up of two major cell populations, neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are highly specialized cells that receive stimuli and generate electrical signals that are sent throughout the body. The neuroglia are special supporting cells that protect, support, and insulate the more delicate neurons. Nervous tissue is found in the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. In Exercise 6, Activity 3, you'll examine nervous tissue under the microscope. Be sure to identify the long, branching neurons as well as the smaller, more abundant supporting cells. Muscle tissue is highly specialized to contract in order to produce body movement. The three basic types of muscle tissue are skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. In exercise 6, activity 4, you'll examine the three types of muscle tissue, their characteristic locations in the body, and their functions. Skeletal muscle is attached to the skeleton, and its contraction moves our limbs and other external body parts. Skeletal muscle is under voluntary control, meaning it must be consciously controlled. Cells making up skeletal muscle tissue are long, non-branching, and multinucleate with obvious stripes. Be sure to make note of these obvious striped patterns, called striations, when viewing skeletal muscle under the microscope. Cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. Cardiac muscle also has striations, but unlike skeletal muscle, Cardiac cells are branching and have a single nucleus. 
A defining characteristic of cardiac tissue is its intercalated discs, cell junctions that allow the cardiac muscle to beat as a single unit. Cardiac muscle is under involuntary control, meaning that we cannot consciously control the operation of the heart. Smooth muscle is found mainly in the walls of hollow organs and can constrict or dilate the cavity of an organ to propel substances along. The spindle-shaped cells comprising smooth muscle do not have striations. Like cardiac muscle, smooth muscle is under involuntary control. During lab this week, you'll be spending time examining each of the tissue types we covered in pre-lab today. You'll be expected to identify all tissues under the microscope for your upcoming lab exam, so work diligently and consider the following advice. Spend time studying the tissue flow chart found on Canvas. Studying a tissue's location and function will help you with identification on the upcoming exam. When studying histology, do not memorize tissue types based on color. It will be tempting to associate different tissue types with the color that they appear under the microscope, but the dye used to stain the cells is often inconsistent. Instead, focus on cell shape, structure, and the tissue's defining characteristics. Consider taking photos of each tissue type through the microscope for future reference. On your upcoming exam, you'll need to name each tissue in a specific way to receive full credit. Review the Naming Tissues document on Canvas. Also note that spelling will always count on exams. Please be sure to complete exercises 3, 4, and 5 reviews before coming to lab. Take your online Canvas quiz and come to lab having reviewed exercise 6. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to your lab instructor.